thank you, Justin, and thank you, Dean Georgiopoulos, uh, for, the, for the invitation to speak and for the kind introduction. Um, so my name is Nita Brown. I am an assistant professor um, here at UCF. I just started this fall 2024 in the Department of Material Science and Engineering. Um, as Justin mentioned, I'm actually hired under the Infectious Diseases and Travel Health Initiative here. Um, and my talk today is really going to focus on how nanomaterials as well as biomaterials can be used for different uh, biomedical applications. I'm just going to give you a very short introduction to one of the projects, but I'm always happy to, to have a chat uh, with anyone interested. Uh, the lab website is also posted um, at the bottom of the slide if anyone's interested to learn more. Um, so really what my research, uh, my career is really focused on is really looking at the intersection of nanomaterials and biology. Um, I've really been interested in studying how materials in biology interact together and how this interaction can actually be uh, leveraged to create new uh, new solutions, new materials or new drug delivery applications that can be used for different types of therapies and diagnosis. Um, I will preface this by saying uh, a lot of my work is really focused in the field of cancer uh, coming in, but um, I, I do wanna stress that the formulations, the work that we're doing can really be applied to lots of different areas um, and lots of different applications. I usually like to start out by this slide just to give everyone an understanding of, you know, what nanomaterials are and kind of where they're used in everyday life and what their their potential is. Um, so nanomaterials are generally anything that's uh, that has one dimension uh, within 100 nanometers, uh, less than 100 nanometers. Um, but they're they're used in lots of different versatile applications. The one that most folks are familiar with is probably the most recent one was the SARS-CoV-2 vaccine. So um, it's really it's really cool to see, you know, you always hear about, oh, mRNA vaccines made a made a huge impact and um, made a huge impact in why we're here today, how we were over uh, able to overcome the pandemic. But you don't really hear about, you know, the, the delivery vehicle that was used for the SARS-CoV-2 vaccines. So uh, just to give you an example is if you actually deliver mRNA into your body, it will basically get degraded just within seconds you need these lipid-based nanoparticles there to actually allow encapsulation of your mRNA and allow it enough time to be able to circulate and get to the site that it needs to, which in this case are your antigen-presenting cells that can allow you to then build your immunity. So that's kind of just one example of where nanomaterials have been very useful in biomedical applications. Another example is um, if you ever took, you know, a SARS-CoV-2 test, a pregnancy test, or any sort of lateral flow assay, you know those little red lines that show up. Uh, those little red lines are actually gold nanoparticles. Uh, they were first used in uh, the first pregnancy test uh, back in the late 1900s and are still probably one of the most prominent nanoparticles that are used uh, today for these lateral flow assays. Um, other types of nanoformulations, um, nanoformulations can, you know, increase the efficacy of treatments, but they can also decrease the toxicity. Uh, one of the first cancer th uh, nanoparticles that were approved by the FDA was something called Doxel. Um, and it was an encapsulation of a drug called doxorubicin. Um, and one of the interesting things about that is that it did not necessarily increase the efficacy of the chemotherapeutics, but it actually decreased the toxicity. So there's a lot of different ways that we can use our formulations. And then kind of the last one is using it as image and contrast agent, which is a lot of work that I did as a postdoctoral fellows where we were designing uh, gadolinium-based um, uh, contrast agents um, with a company in France. And these particles are actually currently in clinical trials at Brigham and Women's Hospital and at the Mayo Clinic. Um, so kind of uh, just to introduce you to the three big research thrusts that happen in my lab. The first one is really designing of nanomaterials to circumvent drug delivery barriers. And I'll go a little bit more into the different types of formulations that we've created in the labs today. Um, our second thrust is, can we actually uh, leverage inherent material biological interactions for nanomaterial design? Um, so thinking about, you know, which uh, materials are more likely to go into which cells? Can we change surface properties to make them more likely to go into certain cells or target them certain ways? And then lastly, can we design tools to actually assess how our materials respond in biologically relevant systems, right? We can do all of this great work. Um, in, in vitro and say, you know, we're, we're getting as close as we can to a biological environment, but there's a lot of changes that happen between when a material is outside to when a material actually ends up in a, um, in a biological system. And can we actually um, identify those changes and leverage that for our next design? So today I'm really gonna just focus on giving you some examples from thrust one, but I'm happy to chat about thrust two and three. Um, so kind of one of the first formulations that, that our lab has been working on are these sustained uh, drug delivery formulations. So they're actually um, these smart implants that are biodegradable 
and they can actually sustainably release drugs over um, 18 to about 60 days, depending on how we tailor our formulation. We can work with uh, different types of drug loading. So we can load hydrophobic drugs, hydrophilic drugs. We can change the loading efficiency, how much drug you unloaded. We can also change how quickly or slowly it releases over time. And so this really allows us to build a platform that's really uh, uh, can be conformed into the application that's necessary. Um, one kind of application of this that that recently just got funded uh, by a breakthrough level to CDMRP. This is a uh, work in collaboration with a uh, with a, a breast tumor immunologist at Brigham and Women's Hospital and Harvard Medical School. Um, so her lab really focuses on these BRCA deficient breast cancer models. Um, so BRCA deficient is a mutation that's found and certain types of gynecological cancers, uh, women that have BRCA deficiency are more likely to develop cancer. And then women that develop cancer with BRCA deficiencies actually are more likely to have more aggressive cancers. Um, so one prime example of this is um, Angelina Jolie was actually an actress who found out that she was uh, BRCA deficient. And so she actually ended up going and having a preventative mas uh, mastectomy in order to uh, decrease her chances of developing breast cancer. The current treatments for uh, these BRCA deficient breast cancers are something called PARP inhibitors. And although they're effective, most patients end up uh, developing, uh, end, uh, end up uh, redeveloping cancers. And so they're not really durable responses. Uh, what our collaborators were able to show is one of the primary infiltrating immune cells within these tumors are actually macrophages, about 70%. Uh, but one thing is these macrophages are generally in a uh, more pro-tumor like polarization. So our idea is, can we now leverage these cells that we have in there and convert them into these um, into these anti-cancer um, cells and kind of use the environment that we already have? Um, they did some work where they were actually able to show something called listing agonist can actually be used in order to repolarize these macrophages. However, um, although this is quite promising, the way that sting agonist is currently given is it's given as weekly into tumoral injections, even in clinical trials today. So as you can imagine, that's not really the best way in order to deliver a treatment. And there's a lot of limitations associated with that. And so this is kind of where our lab comes in from the material standpoint of view is can we actually design and leverage some of these other formulations we have, such as a sustained release implants, to now deliver a solution where we can do a one shot delivery of these drugs and let it uh, let's see how it responds over slow release of these drugs over time. Um, and can that lead to a curate uh, if we're able to couple it with our PARP inhibitors? Uh, the other types of kind of big formulations that we work with is we actually develop a lot of lipid based nano drug delivery systems. Uh, to date, we have a couple that we've already developed in our lab and kind of the newer uh, one that we're working on are these lipid nanoparticles for sting agonists. As you can imagine, our drug delivery system that I presented earlier, the sustained release is great for tumors that are actually easily um, identifiable and easy to inject into. But what about systemic tumors? What about metastatic tumors, right? So we need a response that actually has the potential to be given systemically. And this is kind of where our nano formulations come in. So this is quite preliminary work that we're uh, looking to develop. Um, the reason that I actually also bring up both of these formulations is that uh, sting agonist is known to actually have a lot of beneficial qualities, not just within cancer, but also in other diseases, such as infectious disease. Um, and that's kind of uh, what I'm building here at UCF is can we now leverage some of these formulations to start tackling other diseases, such as um, infectious disease? We've already seen how uh, nanomaterials can have a huge impact in the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic from a therapeutic as well as a diagnostic standpoint of view, can we expand that out and build an arsenal in order to prevent the next health crisis from occurring? Um, and so here at UCF, um, I'm looking to build uh, cross-disciplinary collaborations. Um, I've already started to build collaborations with folks at the Burnett School of Biomedical Sciences, the College of Medicine, the Nanoscience Technology Center. And I think there's as you saw, the work is very interdisciplinary, um, and there is a lot of potential to continue to build out these collaborations. Um, and then lastly, kind of the goal of also uh, being at UCF is kind of building an academic pipeline for the next generation of uh, nanoscientists, material scientists, um, biologists, in order to kind of continue to build up the field in order for us to be able to build translational solutions. Um, and so just kind of end on, you know, this work is not really done in silo. Um, I'd like to acknowledge, you know, my students that were with me at Northeastern, uh, some of them have actually come down with me and then all of our collaborators from the different institutes and our funding agencies. Um, I thank you so much and I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, like I said, if anyone's interested in collaborating, please feel free to shoot me an email or you can also check out our lab website. Thank you.